This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 51 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, December 19, 1908. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. The first section in December the December 19th newspaper is that of the Westford Center section. Mr. and Mrs. Austin H. Foss, who are spending the winter in Florida, sent pleasant accounts to their Westford neighbors and friends of their experiences. They first went to Jacksonville, but are now settled in Tampa, where they have taken a cottage and are housekeeping. Mrs. Sherman H. Fletcher, who has been sick with a serious cold, is somewhat better and getting and gaining strength slowly. She lived uh, at 33 Main Street in Westford Center. At the Christian Endeavor service on Sunday evening, the subject was books that delight and strengthen, uh, which is a quote from uh, Proverbs uh, 4, 1 through 9. Miss Mary P. Bunce was the leader. As an experienced librarian, she gave many helpful ideas on the subject. Among books mentioned by the leader and others as helpful were the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, Thomas A. Kempis, Imitation of Christ, Tennyson's Works, and Drummond's Natural Law in the Spiritual World. Uh, John Bunyan published The Pilgrim's Progress in 1678 and 1684. Thomas A. Kempis, who uh, died in 1471, published The Imitation of Christ anonymously in 1413. And Alfred Lord Tennyson, the English poet, uh, died in 1892. He was poet laureate of England from 1850 to 1896, some 46 years. And Henry Drummond, who died in 1897, published Natural Law in the Spiritual World in 1883. Miss Caroline S. Foy, the reader who was so much enjoyed at the hall last week Thursday evening, was an old schoolmate of Reverend Charles P. Marshall, and she was most hospitably entertained at the Pleasant Parsonage. The next section is called Entertainment. The third in the series of the Grange Entertainment courses took place at the town hall last week Thursday evening when a good-sized audience assembled to listen to Miss Carolyn S. Foy, F-O-Y-E, dramatic reader and entertainer, assisted by Miss Marguerite Pearson, violinist, and Mrs. Minnie Del Castillo, pianist. They formed a trio of charming entertainers and were most cordially appreciated by their audience. Miss Foy is a reader of much experience and ability. Her monologue and stories of children were particularly pleasing. Miss Pearson and Mrs. Del Castillo fully sustained their part of the program with their violin and piano selections. The meeting of the Tadmuck Club which was postponed from the regular date for one week to accommodate the soloists who were to take part, took place in the vestry of the Congregational Church Tuesday afternoon. There was a large attendance of members and guests, and it was one of the most successful gatherings in the annals of the club. The program committee, with the wise intention of appealing to varying tastes, had planned for a musical afternoon, which was in charge of the Mrs. Gertrude, Gertrude and Julia Fletcher, soprano, uh, Fletcher, and they had arranged a program that was most thoroughly enjoyed by the audience. Miss Gertrude Fletcher, soprano, and Miss Julia Fletcher, pianist, were assisted by Mrs. Charles P. Marshall, pianist of the club. Mrs. Charles E. Burns, member of the Women's Club at Lowell, contralto soloist, Miss Annie L. Melindy of Nashua, New Hampshire, pianist, and Alfred G. Elstrom of Fitchburg, cellist. Every, member, every number was so excellent that it would be hard to discriminate in favor of any of the artists. At the close of the program, a delightful social hour was enjoyed. The rooms were prettily decorated for the occasion with Christmas greens suitable to the holiday season. The next meeting, December 22nd, is of special interest when Mrs. Ellen Richards of Boston will be the speaker of the afternoon. 
Mrs. Richards has many friends in Westford, and even if it is in the midst of the busy Christmas season, a good audience will greet her in all probability. The subject of her address has not been definitely stated, but preference has been expressed to her for a talk on the chemistry of foods. Uh, that's an area where she had a great deal of expertise. The next section is banquet. The annual church, annual church banquet of the Congregational Church took place Wednesday at the vestry. These events have taken place for a number of consecutive years, and those having the care of the social events on the church calendar for the year who may have had doubts as to the advisability of the outline of the same place for this year had these doubts effectually dispelled, for repetition did not spoil the happy spontaneity of the feast of good things, the cordial fellowship, the good banquet, and the list of good speakers. Miss May Atwood, uh, who's one of the three Atwood sisters, the church organist, presided at the organ while people began to gather at the appointed hour, 6.30, and very soon after that hour, fully 115 sat down at the long tables, attractively set, with a delicious menu of roast turkey and chicken and all its accompaniments. The decorations were in harmony with the holiday season, in green and red, with evergreen and red berries, Christmas wreaths and ferns. After this part of the program had been faithfully attended to, with its accompaniment of merry sociability, the Toastmaster, John P. Wright, called to order, and in his happiest vein, with the keen wit that never grows stale, introduced some old friends with fresh messages, as well as a number of new speakers. The program was not too long, each speaker keeping within his allotted time, and the audience had no opportunity to get tired, or to get indigestion either, if many a hearty laugh was an antidote. The beloved pastor of the church, Charles, Reverend Charles P. Marshall, came first with a message from among the hills, reminiscent of a trip with two congenial friends the past summer in the White Mountains, weaving in the lessons of strength and beauty of the everlasting hills. Miss Blanche Waller, who was a senior at Bates College, was one of the new speakers. With charming enthusiasm, she outlined the four evangel the four eventful years of college life conveyed to her hearers some portion of the spirit of college life. Charles O. Prescott was next introduced with, quote, the spirit of rural improvement, end quote, for a subject. He sketched most interestingly the aims of the Massachusetts Civic Leave, followed by a resume of the history of village improvement in our own town, closing with a strong appeal for the revival of the old Village Improvement Association. A song by Edson G. Boynton, uh, Just Someone, was pleasantly interspersed, after which Principal Woodward of the Academy was introduced and spoke with much wit and wisdom, wisdom on, quote, athletics and their relation to education, end quote. Miss Eva Pine was to have spoken on, quote, the confessions of a school teacher, end quote, but was unable to be present. The next speaker was Reverend P.G. Favor of Littleton, whose message was church fellowship. Mr. and Mrs. Favor were very welcome guests, and while they are newcomers in our neighboring town of Littleton, Mr. Favor, in his greetings, appeared to have imbibed the record of friendliness that our people have for those in our sister town, and his message was full of genuineness and frank sincerity. Mr. Boynton then gave another solo, Down in the Deep, Let Me Lie, Let Me Sleep Till I Die, after which came the last and best and youngest speaker of the evening, Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey, whose message was among the hills. I, I think that was a little bit of a pun because he's, I'm pretty sure Reverend Bailey was the oldest speaker of the evening, not the youngest. Mr. Bailey was at his best and brought the very essence of a life of noble ideals to his hearers. At the close of his message, the audience rose to their feet and sang with much earnestness, Blessed be the tie that binds, after which came social greetings and the gradual dispersing of the gathering. The committee in charge of the program was John A. Taylor and Mr. Marshall. Those in charge of the supper... Uh, Mademoiselles Taylor, Knight, Bannister, Talent, Grieg, and Miss L. B. Atwood. Decorations, Mrs. May Atwood and Carrie Atwood. The next section is the About Town section. 
Last week, Tuesday, an early morning freight from Ayer had occasion to sidetrack at, Bo- at Brookside on the Herbert E. Fletcher track. This is the track that runs uh, from Brook- Brookside up to the quarries uh, on the north side of Groton Road on the east side of northeast Westford. After returning to the main line, they forgot to close the switch and with, with full steam on, ran onto the side track in the direction of the H.E. Fletcher Stone Quarry. No damage done, but a lively time in reversing the momentum of a hev- heavy freight. The next morning, an early freight s- side track for water on the Fletcher track, leaving part of the train on the main line. The Bixby early passenger had occasion to travel that way and thought that if it was water they were looking for, a bump and a whiz in the direction of the detached engine would be full as likely to strike water. They struck engine and water. That sounds like the water in the engine leaked all over the place. The Unitarian Society will have its usual appropriate Christmas service on Sunday morning, December 20th, but a departure will be ventured after the morning service when the children of the Sunday school will receive their Christmas greetings and presents. The church will be decorated by loyal, thoughtful hands in memory of the occasion. The new hotel station at the corner of Stony Brook and Lowell Roads is completed and ready for 90 boarders. 90 borders. It is 8 feet long, 5 feet wide, one roof, two windows, a floor, and a door. For a further bill of accommodations, apply to John A. Taylor, Sexton, Janitor and Manager, William R. Taylor, Assistant. Uh, This location is where Samuel Taylor's home is located, and the two Taylors mentioned are his two sons, John and William. And it sounds to me like what he's talking about is a chicken coop if they're going to have 90 borders and 8 feet of space. Mrs. S.L. Taylor and John A. Taylor took a sleigh ride on wheels to Littleton on Monday evening to attend the drama The Cameron Pride given at Town Hall. Whether there were any more from Westford they were unable to report for the play was so captivating and the actors so grandly good that they had no rubberneck side visions of anybody or anything else. One hundred dollars were realized from the recent Village Post Office demonstration at Marshallstown Line Hall, Westford Corner. Houghton G. Osgood has sold his apples to Lowell parties, and James H. O'Brien, Frank Bannister, and John Flynn have sold to the reliable Conant a company of Lowell. The next section is the Graniteville section. Scarlet Fever has once more made its appearance here. A little daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Sleep of Third Street is now being afflicted with a troublesome disease. The Sleep family recently moved here from Acton. Every precaution is being taken and it is hoped that the disease will spread no farther. Beginning Sunday, December 20th, and until further notice, Mass will be celebrated in St. Catherine's Church at 9.45 o'clock instead of 8.45, which has been the custom during the past few months. Miss Rebecca LaDuke, the well-known vocalist of this village, assisted on the musical program at the entertainment and whist party given in aid of the Notre Dame de Lourdes Church in Lowell last week, Friday evening. She was accompanied on the piano by Miss Ruth Furbush. Others who attended from here were Miss Grace Ledwith, Miss Lena Healy, Omer LeDuc, Nora LeDuc, and Miss Mary J. Sullivan. The next section is called Christmas Sale. The Ladies' Aid Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church held its annual Christmas sale and entertainment in the church vestry on last week Friday afternoon and evening, and in spite of the inclement weather, there was a goodly number in attendance. Although the weather was disagreeable, the interior of the church vestry presented a much pleasanter scene by contrast. The numerous colored lights and varied decorations imparted a Christmas cheer and giving it a cozy, home-like appearance that was very pleasing to the eye. All the different booths and tables did a good business, but owing to other attractions on Friday night, the management thought it advisable to continue the sale Saturday afternoon and evening, which was done with equally good success. 
The entertainment as given on Friday night, though short, was of high order. And uh, the, it's described here. The program was, conducted, was concluded with a very laughable farce entitled A Picked Up Dinner, presented by the following members of the Westford Grange, John Thompson, Samuel L. Taylor, Mrs. John Thompson, Mrs. S.R. Wright, Bridget McHugh, and Mrs. William L. Woods. The sketch proved highly pleasing and made a decided hit with the audience, the part of Biddy, as given by Mrs. Woods, being particularly pleasing. As to the others that took part in the program, all did finely in their respective parts, special mention being made of John A. Taylor, whose readings were a rare treat. His selections from Kipling were given with a vim and dash that showed that the reader thoroughly understood his subject, and Gunga Din caught the audience from the very start. You may recall from a previous podcast that John A. Taylor was studying oratory at Emerson College. The decorations and those that assisted at the different tables were as, were as follows. Uh, I'm just going to name the tables. It's kind of an interesting list, list. There was a fancy table, a candy table, a mystery table, a pastry table, a vegetable table, and an ice cream table. The Ladies Aid Society wished to thank all those that helped in any way toward the success of their affair. The next section is the Forge Village section. Truly the trend of progression is advancing rapidly in our little village. Very recently, three powerful gasoline arc lights have been placed in position on the main street. The first one is at the main entrance to Abbott Company's mills and not only lights Forge Village but Pond Street also. Number two will light that dangerous turn by the barn of Abbott Company and will assess the peop assist the people in dodging hydrants. Number three will do duty in the square and the Boston and Main Railroad crossing. The lights will be very much appreciated by the people who are obliged to be out during the evening. Many families have street lights at their own expense for some time. The annual Christmas tree at Mission House was much enjoyed Tuesday evening. This is the Andrews, St. Andrew's Mission in Forge Village. The little folks did themselves much credit, and the number that went away with their many remembrances showed their appreciation of the kindness of the men of Groton School. Ever since the opening of the Episcopal Sabbath School, Christmas has been remembered by those who have the interests of this school at heart. Two and sometimes more have kindly given their time and services for the good and pleasure of our children, and a good work has been done. Mr. Richards and Mr. Roosevelt have been the teachers this year. Mr. and Mrs. John Carmichael entertained them before the exercises. The supper given by the John Edwards Hose Company was in charge of the following ladies, Mrs. R.D. Prescott, Mrs. Elmer Nutting, Mrs. Wadley, Mrs. Carmichael, Florence Wadley, and, Rich and Rachel Cherry. Richard D. Prescott had charge of the arrangements. After all expenses were paid, quite a sum was turned into the treasury. The dance was a, su a success in every way. Mrs. John Cannell is at Brook Brookline Hospital, where she will undergo an operation. Mrs. Cannell has been out of health for some time. The members of the school committee visited the Cameron School Wednesday and complimented the teachers on the time made in the fire drill performed for their inspection. Not only was quick time made, but order prevailed throughout the drill. The time was 35 seconds. Miss Lillian Baker was presented with a new upright piano by her parents for Christmas. That's the news in Westford for the week ending December 19th, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transactions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.